praise his holy name. Wasn't that a wonderful time of worship and the musical elements tonight? My goodness, uh, all I can say is I didn't really want to finish that, you know, I wanted to keep going in that. Good news is we've got more for you. So that's the good news. You can see right here on the front table, we will be taking Seudat Hadon, the Lord's Supper tonight together. So I really want your hearts and your minds and your spirits to be focused in that direction. Welcome, King of Kings. So happy you're here tonight. It's, a, it's an interesting time to be together as a community because during the holidays, some people travel, right? They tra they're off work and so they travel, they visit family. And what happens is in the void of some of those people traveling, we get other visitors that are coming in. So bless you guys. We're so happy to see you in the house tonight. Um, Chag Sameach to all of you. Happy holidays. It's great to see you. Welcome everybody watching online, Kings Community Live, Facebook Live, YouTube, around the world on all of the platforms. Welcome to King of Kings Community Jerusalem right here during the holidays. A, a couple of special guests tonight. Just want to welcome our friend Al. Al, good to see you, brother. Uh, blessings to you right here in Jerusalem. We've been partners for a while and, and friends. We see each other often in the pastor's times and the leadership times. Uh, also, uh, Francesca is here. Uh, Francesca, good to see you right here on the second row. Bless you. Uh, this is Eliana's mom. You say, uh, in case you don't know who Eliana is, Eliana belongs to that cello right there. And this is Eliana's mom visiting us from Sicily, B'nai Ephraim in Sicily. This is one of the King of Kings partner congregations right there in Italy. So Francesca, welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I had the pleasure of being at your house, having a great meal after I got to preach at the congregation there, and you did a beautiful spread for us, and I shared that with our, our serving team today, and we have a wonderful serving team. There's so many people, I can't mention how many, up to 40 people are serving you tonight in different areas from, from the Kingdom Kids to the First Encounters to the Lord's Supper to the worship, production and sound, and the, the media team, the cameras. There's so many people serving, and I was telling the serving team today that um, about our meal together, and then they tried to make me convince you to make a meal for all of us after service. <laughs> An authentic Sicilian meal. Raise your hand if you'd like to see that tonight. <laughs> no pressure, I'm just saying. Well, listen, I hopefully you had a great Passover Seder meal. As you know, we've, we've celebrated the, the Pesach, the Passover. Friday night at sundown until yesterday at sundown was the day one. We celebrated it with our little seder, the, the first night seder meals. And, and then, um, of course, we're, we're celebrating the resurrection of the Lord today and the different calendars and how they, how they work out. And some, some of us are looking at first fruits and we're looking at sundown today. Some of us are looking at Sunday, the first day of the week. That's today. We're looking at today. Guys, the great news is that he's risen. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. So we're excited to get to do all that together. So thank you for the honor of celebrating the Lord's appointed times with us. What an honor that you chose to be here for just a little while with us tonight. And we, we pray that you are going to glean a lot from it. I see Jonathan and Chrissy slipping in the back. Welcome, guys. Hopefully you got a nap because I know it was a tough day. See, not everybody in the house knows what's been going on. So Friday night, we ate hopefully a meal with someone, somebody's house, maybe a big meal. And then yesterday, uh, I was able to go preach at one of our other congregations. And then last night, Joanna and I got to share on the, uh, the King's Community online group last night. We talked about pay, uh, Passover. They did a Seder there. So we had some time with them. And then early this morning, we did the garden tomb service. Our worship team and our sound and production team were exhausted. Did they even look exhausted up here? No. Holy Spirit flowing through them. Amen. And Jonathan, you and Tyro and Vaco and so many people got up early. I just trust that the, the Holy Spirit has given you guys grace today. It's great to see you. Another good, good bit of information we had another birth in the community this week, so our congregation got a little bigger. You know that's one of the ways you grow, right? <laughs> Look, you, you can bring in the unsaved, you can bring in the, the aliyah from around the nations, or you can just have babies. And we promote all three of those ways. So blessings to Asaf and Andrea who had their baby this week as well. A lot of fun. 
So listen, I have to tell this story. If you're hearing this story for the second time, my apologies. It's really just that good. So on Friday when we did the Seder, I was with a group of people who wanted to go all in. You know, and you're like, oh my goodness, what are they going to do? They decided to go in the ground and dig a pit and then to put mortar and stone clay bricks around it and then to put a grate, a metal grate over the top and they, they bought these huge pieces of lamb, these legs of lamb that are this big and ribs and shoulders and they're all smoking for like six or eight hours on this open pit grill. I mean, we were taking the word of God seriously. We roasted that lamb. And then, instead of going with the, this matzah, some of you are, you know, you grew up with this as matzah. Come on. You think that's what the Israelites did? I mean, we're, we're grateful that we got this little portable version, right? But what we did is we had someone, this is, this is Gabi, by the way, Gabi Corey. He decided he's going to go for the ancient grains out of Egypt and mix it with seasonings and coriander and smush it and make it into a paste and roll that out. And we had old school matzah roasted on the open fire. Yet yeah, it changed the way you look at Passover, I'm telling you. But praise God, we got to do it together. We did it outside. We had pillows all over the, the ground around this table. And we all laid down and we, we were reclined. And we were, uh, I was able to lead us through that Seder. And by God's grace, we had a ton of kids. By God's grace, we made it. Come on, if you've ever led a Seder with some kids and you get one thank you on the way out, you did your job. I had to hide the offer comb in four times. <laughs> you, know, you know why? Because when one kid found it, everyone else was mad. <laughs> I heard all the excuses. Pastor, you, that was a horrible hiding place. I don't even know why you chose that place to hide. You didn't hide it right. I heard all kinds of excuses. You let him go first. I'm like, no, we counted one, two, three, go. No, he got a head start. That's not fair. I heard one said, he's not allowed to play. I said, why is he not allowed to play? He's already had a bar mitzvah. <laughs> I mean, it was a party. Hopefully you enjoyed that just as much as we did this year. Listen, today we're, we're really just a culmination of so many things that are happening. We're celebrating unleavened bread now. We're talking about first fruits and the resurrection and and we want to mention that if you grew up with, with more of an Easter tradition, bless the Lord that you're able to connect with the resurrection of Messiah and keep it focused on him, right? So we see the culmination of all of these things and the days joining together. You might say, well, why do you tend to mention a little bit more Passover than you do you know, Palm Sunday and, and Good Friday and how come it's First Fruits Resurrection and it's not so much Easter around here? Well, listen, what we're trying to do is we're not, we're not trying to send a judgment signal to anybody. What we're trying to do is really connect with what God created, the way he said it. We're not negating the good of other things. What we're saying is let's focus on what God did. Let's, let's keep with the patterns of the Lord. And the patterns of the Lord are Passover, Chag Hamatzah, that's unleavened bread and, and first fruits. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus 23. We're going to jump in tonight. We're going to have fun in the Word of God. We're going to fill our spiritual bellies tonight, hopefully. And I'm going to ask for the Lord's help tonight as you turn. Abba B'Shemayim, Todalacha, Abba. Thank you, Father in heaven, for, for all things, God. Thank you for your love tonight. And your deliverance, God. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the resurrection of the dead. Help us tonight to glean from your word, to learn more tonight, for our spirits to be open. We say this, Amen. 
Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by your commandments, who gives us life, sustains us, and enables us to reach this season. Let your word be alive to us in Yeshua's name. Amen. Exodus chapter 23, verse 15 and 16, laying a quick foundation for you. Some of you don't need this, but some of you might. You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you, at the appointed time in the month of Aviv. Some of your versions say Nisan. It depends on which language and translation it came from. Same month. For in it you came out of Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Also you shall observe the feast of the harvest of the first fruits of your labors from what you sow in the field. Also the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in the, f- the fruit of your labors from the field. So in this verse pertaining to this holiday of first fruits, we see that in the Hebrew, the original text, Chag Katsir Bikorei, it's, it's a holiday of harvesting and bringing your firsts. And that's why we call it first fruits. That's what, it's, that's what it's called. And then later in the year, there's another harvest festival as we approach the end of the year at Sukkot. Chag Asif. It's the, the harvest of ingathering. And you get both of those from the original Hebrew text. We follow that up with Leviticus 23. So if you're ever curious, like, where do I find these instructions? Just think 23. Exodus 23, Leviticus 23. Verse 10 and 11. It says, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain that you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. Now we know in, that, in this season of Passover, this is the day when Yeshua died as our Passover lamb. And we know that as we move through unleavened bread, that he was in the grave during that time. He was taking away the sin of the world. He was taking away the leaven from us. Remember, we were warned to beware of the yeast of the, uh, and, the, and the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And leaven is seen as a spreading agent of sin. And during unleavened bread, Yeshua was in the grave taking away our sin. And then he rises again on another God-appointed holiday. It's so important that you see all of the prophetic symbolism and the prophetic timing of this, that he rises on this first fruits. We see this from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20. The apostle Paul writes this. He says, but the Messiah has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. You see, it didn't just glance by Paul that Yeshua died as the Passover lamb on Passover. It didn't just glance by Paul that Yeshua was in the grave taking away our sin and our leaven on unleavened bread. And it didn't just glance by Paul that he rose again on first fruits. At some point as a believer in Messiah, you have to stop and you have to say, what is going on? How can this many important things happen on God's appointed holidays? That's why we focus more on Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits. And that's why we start, in a day or two, we start the counting of the Omer. 50 days until Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, is coming. Why do we count it? Because he said to. Why do we focus on it? Because he said to. And we believe that there's something powerful when we live our life the way he said to. And we minimize the things that we make up. We do the things his way as best we know how. Paul understood all of these things. He saw that Yeshua's resurrection was important in its timing on this day. He was, in fact, the first fruits of the dead, which means if he was the first of those that would rise, there had to be others that would rise, right? It doesn't make sense if he's the first one unless we're intending there to be more. And so he's the first fruits, and then we know the graves open, people come back to life, we come to life, 
as new covenant believers in our spirit, we're born again. In fact, he is the first fruits. But did you know in an effort to bestow eternal life on his creation, that God is in a continual process of drawing people to himself that are far away from him? It's a continual process. It's a process he never gets tired of. That there are people in the world, and it, and it was all of us at some point. We were far away from him. In most cases, we were our own God. You say, well, listen, I'm, I'm not one of those people from the ancient times that worships idols and pretends there's other gods. Yeah, you do. I, I did. When, when you dictate the, your own life, that's putting yourself in the position of God. And when you give yourself permission to be God, you are serving an idol. That idol is you. And the Lord delivered us from that because we were far away from him. But this being far away and being drawn in is a significant pattern in the Bible we need to focus on. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was, was given, Peter says this, the promise, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Did you, did you notice that the promise wasn't for those who are already close or the ones who already are super righteous and holy, the ones who already do it right? That's not even who the promise was for. The promise was for all who were far away from him. And now you see the heart of God. You see the heart of God. And a pattern starts to emerge from the scriptures regarding God's efforts to reach us. If you have your Bibles or your devices, turn to Luke 15, starting in verse 17. Luke 15, 17. It says, when he came to his senses, so who, who is it coming to his senses? Well, there, there was a, a rich ruler who had two sons, and one of the sons wanted his inheritance, and he wanted to go off and live by himself. He took his money, his father gave him the inheritance, and he took the money, and he squandered it. He wasted it. He had nothing to show for it. He ended up being homeless and hungry, and he remembered, my goodness, life was so much better in my father's house. Now, I'm not worthy of being a son, but at least I could be a servant. I know my, my dad hires people all the time. Maybe I can go be one of those people. And it picks up the story. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Did you, did you hear the heart of God while he was far off? And then when he saw him, he doesn't just, oh, oh. I see what you're doing. You got hungry. You went broke. I see you afar off. I bet you want to come back. You've got some apologizing to do. That's not God's heart. He says he saw his son. And while he was a long way off, what did he do? Ran. Ran. Didn't even wait for him to get here. Some of you don't know the Lord yet. Maybe you're a visitor, maybe you're new to the faith and you're not sure how this whole thing works and that's a pretty good example of it right there. That if you will just take one directional turn, I'm not even saying take a step, just turn your heart and your mind for a moment to the possibility that God created this earth that he created it good and we messed it up and we separated ourselves from the Father and that he can bring us back into that deep relationship 
And all you have to do is turn your heart to think that that could be true. Just think that it could be true. For one moment. And while you're still a long way off, the Father's going to see you and he's going to run to you. Because that's the gospel story. He's going to grab you. He's going to hug you. He's going to kiss you. And you're going to say, but I'm not worthy of this. And he's going to say, I know. No one is. But I love you. I created you because I love you. And I've got an incredible future ahead of you. That's why I'm making you a meal. That's why I'm putting robes on you. That's why I'm putting gold necklaces on you. This is the heart of God. This is the gospel. That while we were far off. You see a key phrase tonight. The work of Yeshua did not begin when we accepted him as savior. It began while we were still far away from him. That's when the work began. Now our salvation doesn't start until we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart and we make a heart change. But the work of Messiah began while we were far away from him. That's how much he loves us. Romans 5 says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, the Messiah died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Yeshua died for us. Far off, a long way off, still sinners, still unrighteous, still unworthy, he died for us. The work of Yeshua began while we were powerless, ungodly. We were not good people. That didn't scare him. All he wants you to do is just look his direction today. Just look in his direction and he'll come running. Now watch how this invitation continues to be given to people afar off. Luke chapter 14, there's another story Luke 14, 16. But Yeshua said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time for the banquet, he sent his slaves to tell those who had been invited, come, because everything is now ready. But one after another, they all began to make excuses. And the first said to him, I bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going out to examine them. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married. I cannot come. So to the slave, when he came back and he reported this to the master, then the master of the household was furious and said to his slave, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Then the slave said, sir, what you instructed has been done and there's still room. So the master said to his slave, go out into the highways and the country roads and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. For I tell you, not one of these individuals who were invited will taste my banquet. Where did he tell him to go? Go to the faraway places, the highways, the roads, the country roads, the small villages. Go out there and bring in the people that are a long way off. Because the people who think they're close to me aren't close to me. But did you notice how polite those people were? Bring, come to my banquet. Oh, I'm sorry. Please excuse me, sir. I can't come because of my business. Please excuse me, sir. I'm so polite. I can't come because of my oxen. Please excuse me, sir. I can't come because of my marriage. Very polite people. We always say that Yeshua is not looking for superstars. He's looking for servants. He's not looking for the people who think they're righteous. He's looking for the ones who know they're not. And if you will just look in his direction, no matter how far away from God you feel right now, the creator of this universe will run to you, hug you, kiss you, robe you, feed you, and you'll never have another need in your life. 
That's what Yeshua is doing during this feast and festival. That's what Paul understood, which is why he says, wait, this isn't just another day, guys. This isn't just another one of his amazing miracles. This is where the universe changes. Through the Messiah and his work. We see a few times in the scriptures during this very week in the new covenant that there were some others that stood far off. Luke 23, starting in verse 44, it says, it was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn into two. Yeshua called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. And when all of the people who gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from the Galilee, they stood at a distance watching these things from afar. You see, even they had a moment where a crucial thing is happening and they have to decide where are they in the relationship with the Lord. They're not denying him, but they're not right up snug up next to it either. They've taken a couple of steps back. They're watching from afar. They're, they're having to evaluate where am I in this story? What do I think? What do I believe? And you know, yesterday I served him as king and Lord and Messiah, but today he's on the cross and he's not getting down. This is not what I planned. I have to reevaluate. And it's okay to do that. But they did it from afar, some distance away. They knew and they loved Yeshua for sure, but they needed a moment perhaps to bring clarity to confusion or to bring courage where there might have been fear or uncertainty. You know, a little bit earlier in that day, you know, Peter found himself in a similar situation, Matthew chapter 26. Starting in verse 57, those who had been arrested, excuse me, those who had arrested Yeshua took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. And he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. And the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Yeshua so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. And finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Yeshua, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Yeshua remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. You have said so, Yeshua replied. But I tell to all of you, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard this blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and they struck him with their fists. Another slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? And Peter's watching all of this. And where's Peter watching it from? A distance, far off, a little bit of separation. You see, Peter had to reevaluate himself. This wasn't going according to what Peter had planned. And a little bit earlier in that Passover day, Peter finds himself a few steps further away than he normally is. He's watching the lies and the accusations. He's watching no one come to the rescue. He's watching them spit at Yeshua, hit him in the face and slap him and tear his clothes. He's watching all of it and he's saying, I don't know if I want to be part of this. But aren't you one of his? No, no. You look pretty f familiar because I, th I think I remember you being at his side. No, no, I wasn't. it wasn't me. W weren't you one of the ones really close to him? 
Yesterday? No. Today I'm a little bit further. Today I'm at a distance. I'm a little far off today. There's that moment of evaluation. It's okay to have the evaluation. But when you're done, turn your face to Yeshua. Let him run to you. He's not upset at you. That's demonstrated by how quickly he runs. Did you know about the Passover Seder? The scriptures say that when he finally got together with the disciples, he said, did you know how much I have eagerly awaited to eat this Passover meal with you? God is so eager. He's so loving. He's so much running and reaching and grabbing the person far off. You see, some of the crowd, they mocked Yeshua. The soldiers did not only mock him, but they aggressively beat him. They hit him in the face. They whipped him. Even the servants of the priest hit him and made fun of him. But do you know what Yeshua does? Let me, let me explain his heart once again. John chapter 21. You know, Peter has denied Yeshua. He's, he's kind of left himself at a distance. He's reevaluating. He's not sure. He's watched the miracles. But at some point, you have to really make that decision. Am I in or am I out? And, and Peter had had a change of heart somewhere along the way. And in John 21, this is now, Yeshua has died, he's been in the grave, and he's resurrected. He's alive again. And he comes to Peter, and this is what he says in John 21. It says, when they had finished eating, Yeshua said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Yeshua said, then feed my lambs. And again, Yeshua said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Yeshua said, then take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Yeshua asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Yeshua said, then feed my sheep. What is Yeshua doing? He's reaching to Peter while Peter is far off. Peter, don't forget, you just denied me three times. I'm coming to get you. I saw your heart turn. When I was in the grave, Peter, I saw it. I saw you look back at me. I know where your heart really is. I'm coming after you. And he grabs Peter and he pulls him in. And Peter says, you don't have to do this. And he says, yeah, I do. You need me, Peter. Today, you need me to tell you it's okay. You need me to tell you, Peter, I forgive you. I love you. You're accepted. You're in my family. You need this, Peter. I don't need it. You need it. The humility of God. And I want that to be our closing thought. I have some other directions I can go, but I just sense prophetically we got to go here. The humility of God. To die the way he died. And everybody to desert him. To be arrested the way he was arrested and everybody runs off. And then he's in the grave. And then he, he resurrects from the dead. He rises from the dead and there's not a party there's not a celebration. There's not thousands of people. There should have been tens of thousands of people at that momentous occasion. But do you know why they weren't? Because we serve a humble God. He didn't need him to be there. You know why? The resurrection wasn't for him. It was for you. He's so humble that even in the greatest moment of triumph where he has defeated sin, death, hell, the devil, everything you've ever done bad, everything we've ever done bad together, he even goes back in history and he starts talking to those folks and he starts saving them. In the greatest moment of the universe, no one was there 
because of the humility of our God. He didn't need him to be there. He didn't do it for him. He did it for you. And I really want you to take that away this resurrection Sunday, this first fruits. How humble God is in the resurrection. How humble he was in his death. How humble he was in his ministry. How humble he was to even come from a heavenly place and to agree to come into the flesh. That he would even care about such a lowly creation. What a humble God. And that humility is powerful because what it tells you is everything he does is motivated out of love for you, not of himself. It's for you. Now, for those of you that know Messiah Yeshua already, you should be sensing the Holy Spirit presence in the room. You know these words are true. For those of you in the house and maybe online, maybe you don't know Yeshua yet. Get to know him. Turn your face to the slightest possibility that this could be true, that he is the savior of the world, that God himself came to save us because no one else was worthy to do it. That he died on Passover. He took away our sin on unleavened bread and he rose from the dead as the first fruits on first fruits resurrection day. And he did it all without being celebrated, without a big crowd to cheer him on because he didn't need them. He did it for you and for me. First Peter 3, 18. For the Messiah also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and, pro, uh, he, and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Even, even the ones that were that far off. You know, they were, there were some in the stories today that were a little bit far off, some that were really far off. These people weren't just far off, they were historically far off. The Messiah still went and got them, offered them, a full knowledge of what he was and gives them a chance. What an amazing God. Ushers, if you'll come. Serving team, if you'll make your way to the front for a moment. Today we get a chance to respond. We don't always do say uh, at this time of the month, we normally do it at the beginning, the first weekend of every month, but we're gonna do it today because it is a special day. It's all the feasts and the festivals connecting. And this is a chance for us as believers to reconnect on a deeper level. Maybe some of you don't need it, but maybe there are someone in the house who does need it. Maybe someone in the house feels like Peter who took a couple of steps backwards lately and you wanna be right up next to Yeshua like you should be. Maybe there's some in the house tonight, maybe watching online, maybe you're far off, you don't know Yeshua. This is your opportunity to know him. Our closing verse is Romans 10, verse nine. If you declare with your mouth that Yeshua is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. There is no salvation without a confession, and there is no salvation without believing in the resurrection. It doesn't happen. You must believe that he died for you and defeated sin, hell, and death for you. And then the salvation gift is yours. So we're going to take a few moments as the ushers so kindly pass out all of the elements. The worship team is going to lead us Please hold your elements. We're going to follow the scriptures and take these together in just a moment.